Hello there and welcome back to another review. So following on from Godzilla vs Megalon, we now have Godzilla vs Mega Godzilla made all the way back in 19, I think it's 74 this film was released and directed by Jun Fukuda. So I think it was obvious to anyone at this point that the Godzilla franchise has as a whole, I think it's fair to say it was struggling. Um, it wasn't necessarily, I think it was a question of like, it wasn't going where it, it needed to go. And I don't think the people, the powers that be, even knew where they wanted to take it and what they were trying to do. But it was struggling. I think that's a fair comment. And Godzilla vs. Megalon had not done at all well. Uh, but the producers were not ready and done to give up and Godzilla just yet. And, uh, you know... They weren't ready to like give him a rest, you know. They what they knew they what they could uh, get a bit more mileage out of it. They felt there was still some water left in the tank. I mean, I think many sort of remember this film because of the aliens, not because they are just aliens this time, because they are such a blatant rip off of sort of Planet of the Apes in this movie. Like they're sort of monkey, you know, like we've had cockroaches before. Now they're sort of like apes and monkeys. Um, it, I mean, it is in many ways a bit of a rip off of Planet of the Apes. Um, you know, let's just make the aliens apes and monkeys, because, you know, why not? They do mix it up in this film with the idea of, like, a prophecy that has been foretold about these monsters rising up to do battle, which is quite an interesting thing, like the idea of, like, a legend or a prophecy or, you know, something that's been written in the ages that is going to happen. Uh, I think the whole... I, you know, the whole alien thing of okay we will control or send monsters to de like destroy earth was really getting like stuck in a rut at this point so again they always had to try and inject something new well, even if it was the same the end result was the same they wanted to make it so sort of how you got from one state of affairs to the other state of affairs just did maybe a little bit different even if like at least the smallest reason made it seem like it was something new it was something different there was nothing that, that really set these aliens apart. They all just want to control or conquer Earth. That You know, just this time, the aliens are ape, like apes. They're just monkeys. So I think Gigan, like was originally going to be in this movie, but Toho um, thought that Mechagodzilla would be more than enough of a match. I think Gigan was very much, I think, in the planning stages, Gigan was going to be in this one, as far as I know. But I think Toho were like, no, we've got Mechagodzilla. That's going to be enough. That's going to be enough for the audiences to enjoy. Um, plus, of course, it would be cheaper to film one enemy rather than two. I guess the whole cyborg and robot idea is what was hugely popular in Japan at the time. And this movie does try to cater that to like that crowd here. I mean, they... they they do up the stakes. We have had Godzilla do like a flying drop kick. We've had Godzilla speak. We've had Godzilla do a victory dance. We've had Godzilla fly. We've had Godzilla shake hands. Oh, yeah, it turns out, right, in this one, he can just happily turn himself into like a giant magnet as well. So that's something else. They keep on adding these like new strings to Godzilla's bow, uh, things that he can do. But in this one, he can just happily turn himself into a giant magnet. What is great about this movie is you get some of the veteran actors from previous installments, such as Hiroshi, I want to say Koizumi, um, and Kenji Sahara. And whilst not a bona fide classic, we get a real notable villain in Mecha Godzilla, who has become a huge part of the Godzilla franchise and lore, as I'm sure many of you know. I think a lot of people, um, you know, you know Godzilla, you know Mecha Godzilla. I think he's like un yeah, universally people know Godzilla. Universally people know Mecha Godzilla. Um, so like I say Mecha Godzilla being huge with the fan base so for that reason alone this film should be paid attention to for the first film that did uh, feature Mecha Godzilla someone said the film is a complete mess um, it's you know had, had poor direction to those people I say you've obviously never seen um, a really really bad movie and this definitely isn't one of them I mean you know when people say oh it's awful it's really bad it does make me wonder sometimes what films they've seen because of I, I've seen loads of movies and when a film is really bad, when it stinks and it's it sucks, you know a bad movie. Um, so like this film, is it bad? It's not great, but it's not like bottom of the barrel or anything like that. So the first thing when we see the film starts is Angira is crying out and there are like these bright lights with these rocks and cliffs exploding. Um, this priestess called Nami had premonition that a monster will attack the city and her and her grandfather are descendants of this like royal house or, you know, royal creed or something like that. We meet these two brothers, uh, Masahiko and 
Kazuki, I want to say. Kazuki's workers find their underground cave during an excavation. Seiko, a female archaeologist, turns up. In, they, in this cave, they find etchings about two monsters on the wall, which they believe to be, like I mentioned, it's like a prophecy kind of idea, sort of got that whole... Not Legend of Zelda at all or anything like that, but it's the whole idea of a prophecy, um, something that's going to happen, that's going to come to fruition. So there's this prophecy idea. They find this statue too, which um, they, you know, they take, um, and it, it turns out, they take it to, I'm just trying to remember what actually happens. They take it to the professor. Um, and as they're flying out, there's this super, sh like, shady, like guy on the plane like in glasses you're not sure who he is you're not sure where he's come from but there's this like shady guy in glasses there who says he is interested in the statue too thought it would have you know you have no idea who he is i mean the way he looks and acts you would assume he was bad you would think he was a bad guy but we will see how the film plays out Whilst on the plane, they also see some black clouds that are also part of the prophecy. It seems whatever they do, it's part of the prophecy. Like, I ordered a coffee. Oh, that's written in the prophecy. Everything seems to be like there's black clouds. That's in the prophecy. So why couldn't we just have, like, the idea of two monsters fighting like that has been foretold by some prophecy? Did we really need, like, the aliens set up as well? Why couldn't we have just had... The prophecy idea and the monsters fighting did we need this whole alien thing going on as well kazuki's brother also like found some strange metal in a cave and has taken it to another professor who tells him that it's like space titanium so there are loads of earthquakes happening and i love how the guy on the radio is like it could be because of a giant creature that is burrowing underground like you know it could be that's definitely possible it definitely could be a large creature that's burrowing underground because uh, so like kazuki just calmly turns it off as he is laying there you know nothing to worry about it's just a giant creature that's apparently wreaking havoc a guy breaks in to steal the statue and I love how kazuki is getting the crap kicked out of him as his uncle professor is just standing there holding he's just, if you watch this scene he's getting the, like the crap kicked out of him and he's like his uncle sort of professor the guy he's just like standing there like, just holding the gun without a clue what to do. He doesn't have a clue what he's doing or anything. He's just standing there. So Godzilla gets cat catapulted, completely catapulted out of Mount Fu Fuji. For at least we're led to believe that it's actually Godzilla. Because this Godzilla is, like, wrecking things big time. And Giras comes out from under the ground to confront him. But he gets kicked and gets sent flying into a bridge. Even have a barbaric scene of Godzilla breaking his jaw with his hand. Which makes him bleed big time and causes him to, like, retreat. So, so savage in this movie. Like, it's, it's an intro. It's, like, the opening thing for Godzilla. He is, like I say, he is possessed at this point. So after finding the same metal that Masahiko found, Kazuki goes to his brother and this other professor. So suddenly another Godzilla appears. Another Godzilla comes onto the scene. And this is the, this is the real one. This is the real Godzilla. The real Godzilla's here. Uh, the true form of Mecha Godzilla is finally revealed. You have to love the confidence of these aliens as they are like, he is no match for Mecha Godzilla. So sure they are there in their plans. Even though Godzilla inflicts loads of damage, um, you know, and the giant robo Godzilla has to fly back to base. So, yeah, aliens again. Aliens, aliens, aliens. So the Professor and Masahiko go back to the cave to look around as that is where he found the metal and just so happens to be where the alien's base is. I mean, convenience isn't the word. They go back to this sort of cave and that's right there is where the alien's like HQ is. And they're from like black hole planet number three. <laughs> Which, you know, I just love how they, they make these things they're like Space Nebula 9 and, you know, black hole planet number three. You know, it's well known that number three always has the bad dudes on it. I think that's, we all know that, don't we? It's, you know, it's common. And they want the professor to help them. What I love is there are good moments in this movie, like Godzilla and the rain and the thunder, which is something we're not seeing a lot of at this stage. Um, you know, just having Godzilla in the rain, uh, just putting different weather conditions around Godzilla, which I think was quite a good idea. Usually just blue skies and sunny backgrounds, just cool seeing him in the rain. So whilst on a ferry boat, the mugger from earlier who sort of broke in, uh, he tries to steal the statue again and gets shot in the face by Kazuki, revealing the Planet of the Apes mask, or at least half of it anyway. I mean, it was cockroaches before, so yeah, why not? Let's have some let's have some apes in there as well. Let's just blatantly rip off Planet of the Apes, and there we go. Funny also with this scene, when he's chasing around this boat, there is absolutely nobody else there. There is absolutely nobody else on this boat for whatever reason. They seem, it's like this boat is completely and utterly deserted. It is barren. So he got a statue, he went to Professor, then 
the whole like he's got the statue right he's gone to a professor then he's gone back to another professor and then he wants to return the said statue his brother in this too is given very little to do going back to the boat though it's actually quite eerie this scene is there like i mentioned there's nobody else about not even a musical score to add to it at the same time there's not even like um, some music going along with the scene to sort of get you like sort of what kind of scene it's meant to be to aid the scene there's no music at all in this empty boat and like these two having like this scuffle and everything and it's a very eerie uh weird um sort of scene in the movie so the ape guy gets shot by someone unknown and falls overboard with the statue at least we think he's falling all over the statue because kazuki has his head screwed on he's not stupid and he put the real statue in the ship's safe you see now that is good thinking that that's a man who's got a plan you have to get up pretty early in the morning to pull one over this guy. So now they get to the hotel and he's like, where is my brother, the professor and the professor's daughter? Like, not sure why they were meeting there. We have two professors. What purpose his brother serves the story or even what the plan is at this point? It's just like these people are just there, right? These are just our protagonists. They're just there. So whilst investigating the cave, Kazuki is saved by the shady guy he met. Remember I said there's that guy on the plane. You're not sure if he's good or bad at this point or at that point anyway. He's saved by the shady guy he met on the plane and turns out that he works for Interpol. See, not looks can be deceiving. They find the secret hideout and save the professor and his brother from being cooked alive, which if you watch that scene, it when they're sort of in that room, it does outstay its welcome a little bit. It does go on a bit too longer than necessary, that scene. Um, it just drags, unfortunately. So whilst they're rescuing them, for no reason at all, they get changed into some of the guards' uniforms. They're breaking in, right? They're doing, like, a rescue mission. They did, really didn't need to... I mean, it's not like they are sneaking around here. They're not doing, like, a solid snake or anything like that. They don't... They put on the guards' uniforms. There's actually no reason for them to do so because they're just breaking in. They get, they're going to get seen. There's no reason, like for them to get i mean it's not like they're like i say being covert they're making their presence quite known so i don't think wearing guard uniforms is going to help them in the slightest and i love how the aliens just have a password for the door too they just have a password uh, no intelligent futuristic technological security system no just a spoken password that's all that's all they have to get into their base of operations so Soko is at the hotel looking worried and the moon changes colour. She goes with Kazuki and the professor's daughter to return the statue. On arrival, they find the elder and his daughter have been taken hostage. They get saved by Tamura, who is yet an, there's another Interpol agent that comes into the into the mix. And like I say, sometimes, especially with this movie, it's just like there's just characters there. You know, we had an Interpol agent and there's another Interpol agent. Um, they put the statue back, but then goes into... which. Then goes on to shoot a laser, um, revealing the location of King Caesar. Um, oh, I think are from I think it's from or based on uh, Okinawa folklore or thing from that region. I believe I think King Caesar. I think that's sort of where sort of that like the idea for this comes from. It's sort of like I think it's like a temple, like a, a, like the temples, the gods, or like a deity, that kind of thing. I mean, to be fair, this whole thing with the aliens wanting. To like the statue does explain why they wanted it so caesar wouldn't be summoned i mean that does make sense that the statue could summon king caesar and the aliens wanted it so he doesn't get sum summoned which does make sense so mecha godzilla gets launched and the princess awakens caesar by singing a song he goes to take on mecha godzilla and the real godzilla turns up so lots of destruction and lasers here Me mecha godzilla goes mad though he is like a thing possessed this you know Oh, completely overkill, even able to make a shield around him by sort of spinning his head really fast. And that's the thing, at this point in the franchise, you wasn't sure what the monsters were going to do next. You had no idea what kind of special move and thing they can suddenly, uh, randomly do next. Nice touch, they did actually make it that Godzilla bleeds again. A lot heavy this time too, and the first time you see him get really brutally beaten in terms of blood, and then get stabbed with loads of these like flying robot darts, I mean... That's what was so cool that it did make it a lot more brutal, um, you know, in terms of like where they're bleeding, the monsters are bleeding and they're getting stabbed. And it, it does, you really get some more of an impression this is a battle, this is a fight. Um, 
I say the ble the bleeding, you know, really does add a lot to it. We see we see loads of blood uh, like all down his body. So you know this is a tough foe for the big guy. So as mentioned earlier, he turns himself into like a giant magnet and smashes Mecha Godzilla's head right off. Uh, although King Caesar is a god, he really doesn't have much to do in the fight at all. He's meant to be this, you know, deity and this supreme being or whatever it may be. He really doesn't have all that much to do. The alien's base blows up, and these aliens' bases always do. The statue gets put back on, like back in its place. And for some reason, at the end, like you, you, you know, like in the end of most movies, it's like you have all the characters together at the end, and you know, you see all the characters for one last shot. Whatever the movie is, it's common ground. That's usually what happens. But at the end of this movie, everyone is there, yourself and the professor, and like the two Interpol agents. Maybe I mean, maybe they had like prior engagements and things like that, but they just sort of disappear. I mean, yes, the ape aliens is a bit silly, and the film does seem to be in the realms of, let, like I say, let's just go through the motions, a bit of this and a bit of that, and we'll just chuck it in the mix and see what happens. But there is quite a lot to be enjoyed here, and um, like I say, it's worth checking out just for the introduction of Mecha Godzilla. Just one more film to go uh, from the Showa era box set. Um, I will try and get through um, more kaiju movies. I don't want to just stick with I will get round to doing the other Godzilla movies but I do want to review um, a lot more as well so we'll have a look at the last film uh, from the show era box set as soon as I can and um, yeah Mecha Godzilla again so thank you very much indeed for watching hope you enjoyed the review and I'll see you again soon don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory